Hi, I'm Professor David Attlee, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thanks for joining me. In this video, I'll be talking to you about planetary magnetic fields, where they come from, and what they tell us when we go out and measure them. Let's get started. Briefly, let's just review the idea of a magnetic field. If you ever played around with a bar magnet in like elementary school or something, you maybe have seen something like the image on the right-hand side of the slide before. The bar magnet has a north and a south magnetic pole, and then the dark iron filings end up lining up along magnetic field lines that emerge from the south and then move around and re-enter the north pole of the magnet. Planets oftentimes have magnetic fields that are very, very similar to this. We call these dipole fields because there are two poles, a north and a south. But planets don't generate magnetic fields the same way a bar magnet does. So there's not some sort of big bar magnet buried somewhere inside the planet. And instead, a planet is going to generate a magnetic field through a process called a dynamo. This dynamo process is ubiquitous across all planets that have orderly global magnetic fields. And in order to generate this dynamo, we need two important features in the planet's interior. First, we need some sort of liquid electrically conducting layer inside the planet. And second, that planet needs to have at least moderately rapid rotation. It can't be just poking along, rotating super duper slowly. If it does do that, it's not going to generate a magnetic field. How does that dynamo process work? It works because there's a rule in physics that says that whenever you have moving electrical charges, those moving charges are going to create a magnetic field. So in, say, the liquid outer core of the Earth, which is made of iron, you start heating it up and you let it turn liquid. When you heat up all that iron, you have a bunch of free electrons that are floating around. Those are electrical charges. Once you let them start floating around and moving, they're going to generate a magnetic field. So the trick then is how you create a global organized magnetic field out of the behavior of those individual electrons. And this is where the rotation of the planet comes in. So in that liquid iron core of the Earth, say, it's hot near the bottom, and it's still hot near the top, but it's cooler. And as a result, we're going to set up convection. So there are going to essentially be bubbles from the bottom of that liquid outer core that are going to be a little bit hotter than their surroundings and therefore a little bit less dense. And those bubbles are going to float and they're going to rise out towards the surface of the planet. But if the planet is also rotating, those rising bubbles are going to be subject to Coriolis forces. And those Coriolis forces cause the bubbles to curve their paths. So that bubble is gonna try and go outwards, but as it goes outwards, it's gonna bend its path and it's gonna end up taking sort of a helical motion. And if you take lots of bubbles all together, we end up seeing collective behavior like the sort of blue curves that you see on the graphic on the right-hand side of the slide. And if you take a bunch of electrical charges and you move them kind of along those helical paths, that's going to create a dipole field. So it's going to create a magnetic field like the one that we see coming out of that bar magnet on the previous slide and also the one that comes out of the Earth. Anytime we see a planet with a global organized magnetic field, it has to be doing something like this process that I've just described. Other planets, especially Mars for example, have a little tiny bit of magnetism but Mars has what we call a fossil field. So Mars doesn't have a dynamo. It used to have a dynamo that got kind of frozen in in Mars as Mars cooled off. Um, so Mars no longer has an active dynamo and its magnetic field is weak and disorganized unlike the Earth's. So Mars and Venus 
two of the four terrestrial planets lack ordered global magnetic fields. In Venus, this is due in large part to its very, very slow rotation. Venus rotates about once every 243 days. It actually takes longer to rotate on its axis than it takes to go around the sun. And that lack of rotation means that Venus is not able to develop a global magnetic field that suppresses Venus's magnetism. There are some other factors that are important in Venus as well. Um, for example, its temperature gradient is relatively weak, which means it's hard to set up convection. But the lack of rotation is a real killer for Venus. Mars does rotate quickly. It rotates in about 24 and a half hours, just a little bit more than 24 hours. But Mars is small, and therefore it's cold in its interior. So Mars is so cold that it's very, very difficult for that convection to get going, and therefore Mars's iron core is essentially frozen. It's probably not completely solid. Um, this is actually an interesting open question. The InSight mission sent by NASA to visit Mars and study Mars quakes, one of its key goals was to figure out just what is the exact nature of the Martian core. Is it completely solid or is it only mostly solid with a very, very weak temperature gradient? Okay, so I went into a little bit of detail here. Let me just back up a step. For the purposes of our discussions, both in my class and then also in this series, thinking about magnetic fields means we should be thinking about two things. Rapid rotation, and a liquid electrically conducting layer. If you have both, you're going to get a magnetic field. But if you lack either of those, you won't have a magnetic field. And this is going to allow us to figure out kind of what the interior of planets is like. So we could say about Mars, because it lacks a magnetic field but rotates quickly, its iron core is probably completely or mostly solid. Clear? Good. But the Jovian planets don't have iron cores. They have you know, rocky and icy cores, but they still have very powerful magnetic fields. And the reason for those magnetic fields is due to the presence of something called metallic hydrogen. Now you might ask yourself, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I thought hydrogen was a gas, and hydrogen is a gas at the conditions that we're used to on the Earth. But if you start compressing hydrogen, it starts to behave kind of weird. So the outskirts of planets like Jupiter are made mostly of molecular hydrogen. It's H2. And diagrammatically, it looks like the image that you see on the left-hand side of the slide. It's two hydrogen atoms held together by an electronic bond. If we do a slightly more sophisticated version of that image, it's going to look like this. So we'll have two hydrogen nuclei submerged in a sea of shared electrons. Um, so they each have a little bit of their own electron probability, and then there's some shared probability between them. But if you take a molecule of molecular hydrogen, like the one you see depicted, and you put another one next door and another one next to that and one up here and one down below, and you start mushing them together, the pressure is going to start compressing all of those hydrogen nuclei and they're going to start to have kind of similar distances to one another. And if you get the pressure and density high enough, you end up seeing something totally different. So instead of having two isolated nuclei that share electrons between them, we end up with a bunch of nuclei all sharing all of their electrons in a common pool. And this is sometimes called an electron C in solid state physics. When you do this, those shared electrons, they can now start to flow around and they can move in between all of these hydrogen uh, nuclei more or less freely. And this is how terrestrial metals, substances like copper or iron, will conduct heat and electricity. And that's why we call them metals, because they have this structure. So when you take hydrogen and you smush it down, it starts to act like a metal. It conducts heat and electricity, but 
it's still kind of fluid, so it can still flow around a little bit. So we've got a liquid electrically conducting fluid, and da 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 da, we get magnetic fields. So Jupiter has a very, very thick layer of metallic hydrogen because it's so massive and its gravity is so strong, it can do a lot of the compression necessary to create that metallic hydrogen. And as a result, Jupiter's rapid rotation combined with this really thick layer of metallic hydrogen leads to a very, very strong magnetic field. It's the strongest magnetic field of any planet in the solar system by an order of magnitude. Saturn has a reasonably powerful magnetic field. It's the third most powerful in the solar system after Jupiter and the Earth, but it's much less powerful than Jupiter because it has much less metallic hydrogen. Its lower mass means it can't compress its hydrogen as much and therefore has much more molecular hydrogen, proportionally speaking, than Jupiter does. Okay, so we've talked about how planets develop magnetic fields. They do this through a dynamo process that creates ordered global magnetic fields. In order to work effectively, that dynamo requires that the planet have at least moderately rapid rotation and a liquid electrically conducting layer in the planet's interior. And both of those are necessary in order to set up these global magnetic fields. In the terrestrial planets that have magnetic fields, those are generated within the liquid outer layer of the iron core. Jupiter and Saturn rely instead on their metallic hydrogen, and then Uranus and Neptune are weird, so I'm not going to talk about those here. But we can use the presence or absence of magnetic fields, along with the relative strength, to provide some information about what the insides of planets are like. So when we try and model the interior of Jupiter and figure out its internal structure, the shape and strength of its magnetic field is one important data point we can use to help develop that model. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon for another Topic in Astronomy.